What is up, everybody? It's Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem but focus on the solution, and we're doing something a little bit new, and as you can see, I have a very special guest, and go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, Chris. I'm Dr. Todd Grande, and uh, I appreciate you having me on here today. Yeah, thank you for coming on. And so the purpose of this video is, as you all know, I took a little bit of a break and there's been some craziness going on and I am trying to grow as a content creator, as somebody to help people with mental health. And a lot of you have seen, which we'll talk about pretty soon here, Dr. Todd Grande did a criticism of my channel, which, you know, was very fair. And we're kind of we're kind of trying to get together and try to figure out how we can better discuss mental health on YouTube so we can help more people. Does that sound about right, Dr. Grande? That sounds right. All right. So the first thing I, I want to do just to get this out of the way, um, there's been some conversations around my mother, Dr. Carrie Randazzo, and I just wanted to get uh, just have you help explain to the audience um, about credentials and licensure and things like that, even though it varies from state to state. So my mother has a PhD in psychology. She's currently not licensed, but she's... Um, built an amazing reputation over the last 20 years. She's been a clinical director of a intensive outpatient treatment center. She's actually speaking at the CCAP P conference, um, which is a addiction conference in California. But can you kind of explain how that works like um, between like a, 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 like a psychologist without a license and how they, how they practice how they you know, help people, how they get invited to speak at events. Can you kind of explain how that works? Sure. Well, first of all, important to kind of make clear that I'm a, I'm a counselor educator, PhD, okay. so not a psychologist. It's a similar field, but a little bit different, just like social mm -hmm. work would be a little different from both of these professions. But all the professions function a similar way when it comes to licensure. So licensure is essentially a function in the United States anyway at the state level. So you have to get a license through a state licensing board, and you have to meet certain qualifications to do that. That's separate than education, right? So now in my case, it's a little unusual because in my profession, you can get, ma you can get licensed at a master's level. Mm. So I earned my master's degree, then I became licensed, then I got a PhD. Okay. So I was never a PhD without a license. In the world of psychology, they have really two different ways to get licensure. They have the PhD psychologist and the PsyD. Mm -hmm. So they have to get that degree before they can get licensed. So there's mm -hmm. always going to be a period of time, for a psychologist anyway, where they've graduated mm -hmm. and they're not licensed. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you get a degree doesn't mean you have to get a license. You can decide not to get one. You can find a job. This happens to a lot of counselors. They find a job that's pretty good where they don't need a license. So they think, mm -hmm. well, why am I going to submit to oversight of this board when I don't have to, right? Yeah. It's like who asked to get regulated, right? The only reason you would ask to be regulated is if you want to build insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to build insurance companies, there's not really a huge need to get a license uh, in some places. So if you want to do like consulting and all that, it helps to have a license. I mean, I think it's a good idea because it maximizes your education, right? Because mm -hmm. you can build insurance and you can supervise and do some other things, but they're separate constructs. Education is separate from licensure. Yeah. So in my mother's case, for example, being the clinical director um, at an outpatient center, they were billing insurance, but that comes with supervision. Am I correct on that? Like as long as you have supervision, then you can bill insurance because that's kind of what I believe was my case working in an addiction treatment center because I'm not licensed, but the psychoeducational groups I did were being billed to insure. Right. This varies wildly from state to state, right? So in some places, you absolutely have to have a license to bill insurance. Mm. And in other places, you can kind of fall under a group practice, like a hospital is a good example. You mm. can work in a hospital, like a drug and alcohol treatment hospital, and you may not have a license, but they're still billing as a group because gotcha. they have so many licensed people that they qualified for that. So, yeah, that really varies quite a bit. And two, you have to remember that uh, insurance companies aren't the only way to get money. A lot of agencies use state funding, mm -hmm. right? So I used to work for a place that I contract with a Delaware funding source, and I had some licensed people that I supervised, but other people weren't licensed, and we got paid either way. So Got it. You really have to look at the individual circumstances where you are. 
Got it. Okay, so audience, I hope that clears some things up. That also answers a few questions about me and my work history and how I was able to work at a drug and alcohol treatment center and do groups and all that stuff. But yeah, so let's jump into this. Again, the purpose of this is kind of to, you know, so, you know, I can grow as a mental health channel. Um, also, you know, Dr. Todd Grande is going to give me some advice from his, you know, professional background. So the first thing I kind of wanted to touch on, and I'm always fascinated by perspective, you did a critique of my channel, right? So when I watched it, I was like, this is a very fair criticism. Like, this is fair. What are you saying is very fair. So I saw it as, you know, uh, a, a very good criticism. Now, other people interpreted it as you just saying my channel's terrible and shutting it down, like... Kind of summarize, can you, and I, I promise my feelings won't get hurt, can you kind of summarize, like, you know, your your views on my channel? We'll dive more in depth in a little bit, but just kind of, like, overall with my channel, like, what are your, your thoughts, like, my competency and things like that? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, when I did that critique, I think you were in a little bit of a different place, right, mm -hmm. like, before a lot of the controversy, so... Obviously, I reserve the right to change it a little, but I think I, I largely feel the same way. I mean, you cross some boundaries there with that, I guess it was like direct messaging, and you know, mm -hmm. that's what I call, um, well, in German, they call it uh, Schadenfreude, right? The joy in others' pain, right? And so, you know, I think that kind of got you in trouble with, with part of the, the YouTube community. But mm -hmm. outside of that, that was the big change that happened from my critique. That was the only thing that really changed is mm -hmm. you got caught, I guess, or <laughs> whatever happened. Yeah. There. But, um, you know, outside of that, I think that I actually, in my review, I think I was largely positive, right? I think I mentioned at the end that I was kind of leaning more toward a positive review. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my concern was, I think, the same concerns we see with, with many groups, which is you're getting close, if not blurring that line with, like, looking at somebody else and deeming them to be a public figure and then saying, okay, they're fair game for uh, opening up, like, a mental health discussion, Mm -hmm. So you're right on the line, right? You're, you're right on the line. Sometimes maybe you squeaked over it a bit, right? Yeah. Um, but what I liked about the channel is, you know, well, clearly you figured out the YouTube algorithm, right? You figured out how to be successful, how to get engagement, how to get views. And that's no small feat. And I also liked your energy. I mean, you had a lot of productivity. You're making a lot of videos. Uh, the mm -hmm. editing was fairly clean, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you had just good productivity and good efficiency. But I think that, you know, you just ran into that whole issue with that line, like how much kind of information can you take from the public sector, from somebody's yeah. public life and then bleed it over into their private life and say, well, they did this, so they might have a mental disorder. They did that. That's a symptom of this disorder. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was the blurry part. Yeah. And I think if you had managed to stay a couple clicks inside that boundary, you, you know, you would have been okay. I think you could yeah. get through and, and uh, you know, solidly got the silver button and moved up from there. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's pretty much, I'm summing up like a half hour critique or whatever, but that's, that's yeah. pretty much where I was. And, yeah, and, and kind of the goal of this video, and I'm going to be talking with some other um, licensed professionals on YouTube and things like that, um, is trying to find, you know, like, like that line is blurry, right? And trying to figure out what I could do better so I don't cross any boundaries. And because... You know, at the end of the day, I made hundreds of videos that weren't really getting viewed, and then I realized the algorithm and how to tie these things in and kind of use that as a jumping off point to dive into a more, you know, a topic more meant for the audience rather than a critique of the YouTuber. So I'm hoping that I can do that a little bit better. I'm not really going to be focusing on YouTubers as much, but, you know, just to cover my butt in the future. So I guess one of the first things I want to ask you is, um, so defining the line, um, you and I, before we hop on this call, defining the line between like a drama channel and a mental health channel. And you've seen my content and kind of that, that jumping off point, like here's the subject, right? Here's to give you context. You guys have all seen this video that I'm referencing. Now, how can you relate it to your life? Like, do you have any opinions or views on like that line right there between a drama channel and a mental health channel? And you've seen some of the controversy with me. Have you seen a difference between my content and what quote-unquote drama channels are creating and what the difference is there yeah you know um i haven't watched a lot of drama drama channel videos and mm -hmm. i don't know if they fit into as clean a category as like a mental health channel like i always know when i'm on a mental health channel and i think sometimes i've clicked on the drama channels and not known and then <laughs> kind of figured it out right yeah uh but 
My understanding, and I could be really off on this, is that this is a community, the drama YouTube community or whatever it is, they kind of feed on the drama that plays out among what I call the quasi-celebrities, right? The YouTube famous, right? Which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, markedly different than like a Hollywood celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. And mental health channels are there to educate and to raise awareness, help people you know, identify that they might need to seek therapy or to resonate, right? Sometimes it's just they're there to resonate. You mm -hmm. talk about things and people could say, yes, I've been through that same thing. I identify. I don't see any overlap between the two, right? That's where I struggle. I mean, I, I realize yeah. it could be for like thumbnails and, and for saying, you know, I'll mention this person in order to get somebody to click. But I look at them as, as so distinct. It's like if you said, like, I like car channels, right? I love fixing my own cars, my own pickup trucks. What's the overlap between, um, you know, Scotty Kilmer and my channel, right? Nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's a great channel, but it has nothing to do with mental health. Yeah, right? exactly. So I, I, yeah, I fail to see the relationship, although you clearly found a way to, to weave them together a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and that was, yeah, that was, might have been a mistake on my part, but we're learning and we're growing here. <laughs> so, so you, you know, you being a, a, a professional in this field, like, something that I'm trying to do, and, you know, I kind of went to the forefront, um, because, like, I, I want a lot of mental health channels to rise, and part of what this conversation is, is, so smaller mental health channels watching me, watching what's happening to me, so they can hopefully avoid some pitfalls, like, what are your views on, like, should unlicensed professionals be allowed to talk about mental health or even educate, because a lot of mine... You know, a lot of my education has been self-education, right? I've done some schooling to get uh, my CADC. I still need to finish that by the end of the year. But a lot of it is just like I have books all right here. I just have books on psychology and mental health and different disorders and everything like that. So what are your views on should unlicensed professionals be able to talk about, you know, mental health, mental illness, um, coping strategies, like, and, and on top of that, should they be held to the same standards as a licensed professional like what are your thoughts on that right so this is this is a great question um and you see kind of this this line right that separates the mental health youtube channels between individuals with like the education that matches a license and individuals the license and individuals who may have experienced a mental disorder or knew somebody and they kind of come into the field like come into the the on the platform into this area the mental health realm and start talking. So to answer the question, I think that everybody's invited to this table, right? I don't see this as like a, you know, this is YouTube. Anybody can get on. It really only takes the equipment that mm -hmm. we have right here, right, to get on there. And that, in a sense, is, you know, maybe that's a low bar, but that's where we are. Anybody can come on and make a video. Now, should they is a different question. I would, <laughs> I would look at it this way. I would say that for somebody who's a professional and licensed, it's pretty clear, right? They have expertise in the mental health area. So if they want to start a YouTube channel and they want to talk about anything that they understand, then that makes sense to me. If somebody's not licensed, if they're not a professional, I see more success in them talking about their personal experiences and then what they kind of learned along the way from that, right? Because somebody with a disorder can give great perspective on what it's been like to be in treatment, what it's like to learn this material without going through the formal education, right? Mm -hmm. So there's still a ton of value. Where I think I get a little bit worried, and again, I can't do anything to stop this. I'm not the YouTube police or anything, but <laughs> where I get a little worried is you'll see sometimes people do a great job talking about something they understand, and then they'll wander off into an area they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this is like you don't know what you don't know, right? I have, um, I don't know what it is, uh, 11 years equivalent of education after high school to learn this. Mm -hmm. And every, you know, every moment of that, I was learning something, and even now, after graduating many years ago, I'm still learning something every day. I read an article and I say, wow, I'm glad I didn't do a video until I read that because I would have totally messed that up. Mm -hmm. Right? So you really have to have the mechanism to get the information in order to deliver it in an accurate way. So uh, and this is where I need you to give me a little tough love. Based on the content that you've seen from me, do you feel that um, I've improperly explained things or acted like I knew more than I 
did, you know, for example, um, you know, I've had some backlash on my videos about borderline personality disorder. I don't know if you've read the book, um, uh, I Hate You, Don't Leave Me, which is a book that's, you know, they've created a, a newer uh, version with new scientific studies. And a lot of the information that I've relayed has come directly from that book, which is often cited by other professionals. Um, I, too, read a lot of studies. Like, just from your opinion, like, and I need to know this stuff, have I have I wandered and given misinformation? I know we. Uh, I know you mentioned something about AA, and I, I sent you a study. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it yet, but like other than that, like have you seen me kind of just throw out some dangerous information? Yeah, I mean, I think to be fair, I looked for misinformation. I looked for uh, problems. That's what I do when I critique channels, right? I I assess the positive and I assess the negative, and I just give a balanced delivery of it. I tried to, a fair delivery. And I didn't really find a lot that you missed. Uh, I pointed out a couple small things, I think some technical errors, which I could find even if I watch my own videos, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not, that's something that I'm, I become attuned to is finding technical errors. But no, I was actually um, kind of pleasantly surprised about the content and how you had prepared pretty well for your psychopathology specific type videos, right? Mm. The ones where you talked about a specific disorder. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'm hoping in the future, because I know you're an extremely busy man and some of the other licensed professionals, but hopefully, like, I, I want you to call me out if you say, like, whoa, Chris, that's some real bad misinformation or, you know, something like that, because I I definitely don't want to be the one to just throw out some dangerous information. And one thing that I guess we'll address real quick is, like, I think there was just a misinterpretation on, but I understand, on, on my video about mental health professionals not getting paid. Um, and I think I didn't communicate it properly which is why I understand your view on it. But like, basically what I was saying is, is I worked at a treatment center where it cost $30,000. Like we build $30,000 and a lot of people couldn't go to that treatment center. But I wish there was more, what I was saying was, I wish there was more professionals like yourself doing additional free content, like on YouTube to educate those who can't afford treatment. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the way I interpret it, of course, as you know, is a little differently which is yeah. kind of the same old thing. And maybe, you know, maybe part of it was it connected with an argument I've heard so many times, which is the whole, you know, if clinicians just work for free, you know, everybody would be happy. And we know <laughs> that actually leads to disaster. So I didn't, yeah. didn't want to let that go as I saw it. But <laughs> yeah, in terms of like, you know, professionals doing other things like YouTube, writing blogs, giving speeches, doing trainings, doing consults, that's brilliant. I mean, I think that's, yeah. I, I think you're right. I think that clinicians need to not just stay in like that comfort zone, like right in front of the client, but also get down to the community and be an active participant. That makes sense uh, to me. Yeah. See, we, we agree on that. So next let's talk about, you know, the, the mental health stigma as a whole. And I'm curious what your views are with me being involved in this controversy going on. Like, how do you think that's that's playing in the stigma? Like, you've watched my content. Do you think, like, two things. Do you think I was increasing the stigma by doing what I'm doing, talking about mental health or what other mental health YouTubers are doing? And what do you think about this? Because I've seen some stigmatizing things happen just with some of the backlash I'm having. You see what I mean? Like, no, yeah. you're not allowed to talk about mental health. This is a taboo subject. And that's kind of where I'm struggling. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. You know, I, I have, uh, you know, pretty pretty clear values on this, right, as you might have uh, might have reasoned. You know, I kind of, yeah. I have opinions about things. And and I, and I form them over a long, a long period of time, even though I'm willing to change them if I see evidence to the contrary. And, you know, the, the idea that your channel could like globally increase stigma is unprovable, right? That's just, uh, okay, maybe it did, but uh, maybe any channel did, right? That's very hard to say. Yeah. What I think is more definitive, I think it's a safer statement to say that you clearly offended certain people, right? Absolutely. You crossed the line with certain people and they had every right to be upset. And I, and I totally get that. Um, and, you know, whatever backlash they generate from that, you know, you have to kind of take that in consideration that you kind of offended first, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it should be fair to them. But the idea that, you know, I do have a problem when people come forward and say, you know, I have a complaint and everyone else shares my complaint, right? You ever hear that? It's like the mentality, right? Somebody comes up yeah. and like, you know, I don't like this place and everyone else here doesn't like this place either. Well, I'm, I'm very yeah. big on kind of rugged individualism, right? Like I look at it like, look, 
own it, right? If you don't like yeah. where you are, you tell me, okay. But don't speak for everybody else, right? Let everybody yeah. speak for themselves. I mean, so yeah. I kind of, I think some of what you're seeing, again, is legitimate because you broke the rules, right? Fair enough. And some of it is, I think, a desire to jump on the rewired soul train, right? <laughs> Which yeah. is, you know, you can get views by making videos criticizing your channel. Yeah, something that I've been struggling with, and I'll have videos just about how I'm working through it and stuff like that, but um, that kind of speaking for speaking for everybody, right? Like, there are clearly people who don't like my channel, don't like what I do. That's okay. But going through, you know, um, comment sections, going through, you know, like to dislike ratios e even, you can see how many people who have said, thank you for helping me, right? So, you know, I, I'm also about that individualism and, you know, like, and I, I just, I found it interesting that you're saying you are, you are hurting people. And it's like, but this person said that they watched my video and thanked me because it encouraged them to go back to therapy. So, you know, how can you speak for that person? And that's, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> right. Well, it just, it gets into an existential issue, right? Not to, not to bring us to a darker place, but yeah. essentially, you know, we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone, right? So all these people saying, well, everyone feels the same way as me and let's just pile on. That's not supported by any evidence. It's an individual experience. Life is, right? Yeah. So if somebody has a beef with you, right, they bring it to you, they put in a comment, they email you, whatever. And I think you've, I mean, you've been pretty forthcoming that that criticism is there. You haven't deleted comments. I mean, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, I think some people found your apology less than satisfactory because you put the word but in there and all, but yeah. I, I get it. But overall, I mean, you took down the offending videos and you did apologize and you're not deleting mm -hmm. comments and you're letting everybody have their shot. Mm -hmm. What, what more, like, if you had stolen something, you go to jail for 30 days, your sentence would end, right? So when does this end? Right. Like, yeah. And that's, that's a whole, that, yeah. And that's a whole nother thing. I listened to, you know, and that's an issue with cancel culture, which I think would be a great video for you to do. Like, because we see it happening with celebrities and YouTubers all the time. And to be fair, because I know this will be brought up, I am going to make a video about working with my therapist. I am setting up some boundaries. So I have gone into the community tab on my YouTube thing and I've made like blocked words, <laughs> like just certain words for my own mental health sake. Cause seeing certain words, but anyways, that's people will learn more about that in a video I do but yeah for the most part I try to give people a free platform to say their gripes with me and things like that and and have a conversation um so this next question I I think is it is going to help me learn and maybe this is going to help other mental health channels so the question is how do we capture the attention of YouTube viewers and you're a YouTube creator right and you know, you know about the keywords and all that kind of stuff, trying to please the YouTube gods of the algorithm <laughs> and everything. And and yes, I found a way to reach the audience, right? I found that way. So unfortunately, like we said, it's it's kind of blurred a line. But like in your opinion, like how how do we how do we reach the viewers when, for example, people aren't searching? Like they're not always. I, you've been very successful. You're one of the larger mental health channels. But like people aren't searching certain certain disorders. People aren't searching certain like like how to cope with depression on YouTube. People come to YouTube for mainly entertainment, some education. So and like, how do you think we could do better of reaching the audience without crossing any lines? You know, that's that's really the that's really the uh, the pivotal question, right? Because that's where your channel was. Right? Yeah, your, your channel was kind of uh, successful at the mental health largely, but also successful at the attracting viewers. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, one thing I think is you certainly can use the trends, which, you know, you learned well, you can capitalize on trends. I do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I saw a, a video, we talked about this before with the, these body language experts, right? And how they're yeah. always, um, you know, there's a few popular videos out there. And I, I made a video and released it today to, to kind of yeah. ride that wave. It also was a topic that I was very interested in. I've actually done other videos about it. So you have the trending piece. Of course, you have the typical thing we hear from all like the, the YouTube consultants, right? Like build good content, production value, all this stuff. But we already know all those criteria, right? Those aren't yeah. revolutionary. So the, the last frontier, so to speak, I guess would be trying to introduce, trying to connect mental health to what you're seeing in 
the YouTube community or in the news or whatever is trending, like trying to, mm -hmm. to get a little sharper and going after that trend. But this is that place where you got in trouble. This is that, that difficult area. You know, to give you an idea how much I fret about this, <laughs> I, made, I, did a video, I did a video about Ted Bundy, right, mm. um, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Ted Bundy was executed for murdering 50 to 100 women, right? Nobody likes Ted Bundy. Does right. that make sense? Like, he's not, you know, he's not going to have any big fans be like, oh, you said something bad about Ted Bundy. Yeah. But, you know, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of, you know, I made it clear I wasn't diagnosing him because I didn't know him and I wasn't his clinician. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I draw that. I, I'm standing to where I can barely even see the boundary is so far away from me. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. You have made a reputation and I think have had success in getting a lot closer to that boundary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Are there some general rules for like getting up right, right on that line without crossing it? Right. Without, mm -hmm. without offending. So I would say, you know, I actually wrote down a few rules here. I typed out a few rules. Okay. One would be, uh, you know, never diagnosing. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe even going as far to do what I do, which is say, I'm not diagnosing. I'm mm -hmm. speculating. Right. It's my opinion based on what was made public. Yes. Right. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, if you're talking about yourself, you can say whatever you want. If you have consent of somebody like another YouTube content creator says, look, I have this disorder and you really seem to have a connection with it. You understand it. You can go ahead and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I would probably put their consent right in the, the, the video. Mm -hmm. the, the next area is kind of like, um, and we talked about this before on the phone too, in order to even introduce the idea of connecting mental health to somebody, they have to truly be a public figure, right? Mm -hmm. Like Ted Bundy was a public figure. So if, if you're looking at somebody and they're like a YouTube content creator and they have a couple thousand subscribers, that's relatively small. I mean, it's an accomplishment, but that's relatively small compared to like your channel. Yeah. Right. So it's about figuring out when does somebody truly become a public figure and when have they kind of by their own hand have exposed themselves to these types of ideas. Yeah. And that's where I struggle. I was actually right before we hopped on this call, I was thinking about it because part of my new content strategy is talking more about mainstream mainstream celebrities right and I, I don't know how much you follow like philip defranco and stuff but he's done some things about how youtube youtubers want to be taken as seriously as mainstream celebrities right and so for me looking at this aspect and like obviously i found a formula that works bringing in a public figure talking mental health can you relate to this because a lot of people like it's no secret a lot of people watch certain youtubers because they can relate or they like certain celebrities because they can relate right so that's kind of how i made that connection but for me to say, okay, I'll only talk about the mainstream celebrities and it's okay to quote unquote dehumanize them, then why, like, why would that be okay? You, does that make sense? Like, yeah. like, so, so, so like you're saying with that, with like, if we're doing like a strict rule, like where's that line? Is it, is it a hundred thousand? Is it 200,000? Is it 500? I've talked about one of the biggest controversies I had was with someone with over 4 million subscribers. Like, that that is a very small percentage of people on YouTube who have that many subscribers. So where, so what are your what are your thoughts on that? Like where where yeah. is that line of public figureness? So first, just to clarify, I wouldn't say that we can de dehumanize anybody, right? Like exactly, no matter how big, right? But <laughs> yeah. what public figures do, and what you and I have done essentially, is we've exposed ourselves to criticism, right? Mm -hmm. There's no getting around that when you become a public figure. There's a tradition where you do lose some of your privacy, right? Yes. But I think that still only gives license essentially to say, okay, you know, Dr. Grande appears to have this problem because I watched one of his videos and I saw this, but yeah. I don't know if he has this problem, but I want to talk about what I think this problem is, right? Yeah. That's a lot different than saying Dr. Grande has a diagnosable disorder or, or kind of implying or hinting that, you know, I could be assessed that way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, in terms of the line though, and what I'm saying about the line in terms of public figure, when somebody drops below the threshold, I don't even think it's okay to do that. Like if your neighbor, like my, not long ago, my neighbor, one of my neighbors drove into my pickup truck. She, she accidentally hit the accelerator instead of the brake and yeah. she ran into my pickup truck. And um, I let it go because she's my neighbor and it wasn't, it's a truck, right? I mean, that's what trucks are for. But if I made a video about her, right? If I'm like, hey, look at my neighbor who hit my truck, she's off limits because she's not a public figure. Yeah. Right? She's not in the public realm. I would say if you go by the, you know, how YouTube appreciates success, 
it would be maybe around 50,000 subscribers. I don't know. If I had to if I had to use a number and it's hard yeah. to quantify these things. I don't know. I think when you reach 50, it seems pretty clear you're going to make 100 <clears throat> at some point. What's what what's what else is fascinating to me too is it I'm myself and even you and you in the future might be in a difficult position because I I have over 800 videos on my channel right now and only I can only count three I named those youtubers in one of my apology videos and those are the videos I took down three youtubers who got offended by my videos but I'll, I'll mention Illymation because that's my number one video. It's almost at a million views. She thanked me for my videos on her, right? She thanked me. And now that I'm bigger, like I plan on trying to get consent and reaching out and saying, hey, you know, like that's, that's something that I'm personally working on. But as a smaller YouTuber, like, because I went from, in October I had 18,000 and then I jumped to 100,000 like that, right? So I... I blew up faster than I could even comprehend and didn't realize how many people were seeing my thing. So that's something I'm going to try to be better about. But that's kind of interesting, don't you think, that some people get offended by what you're talking about and some people thank you for what you're talking about. Like Illumination thanked me and said, I learned more from this about what I went through that I hadn't even learned in my own therapy sessions. Does that make sense? And that's kind of an interesting thing. Right. Well, you know, and it becomes a morbid calculation, right? So if you ran your channel, like if you could run it for a thousand years... Yeah. And in that time, you were going to offend three people, and you could help three hundred, or a thousand, or a hundred thousand. Where do, where do you make these calculations, right? Where do you say it's okay to have this offending to helping ratio? You know, yeah. Generally, I say if you always stay within the boundary, and and you're and you're purposely saying, look, I'm not assessing anybody. You know, you're pivoting off of the celebrity or quasi celebrity and moving to your point. Then you shouldn't have any problem, you know, regardless if somebody says they're offended or not, as long as you stayed in the bounds. Got it. Right? That's that's kind of how I look at it. I mean, if if they're gonna say something and you follow the rules, then it's really more of how they're perceiving it. And okay. I don't know what more you can do. Look, people can get offended by anything, right? Any channel. Any yeah. any video that I make or anybody else makes, somebody can look at that video and say, not only do I disagree at a rational intellectual level, but for some reason I disagree emotionally i feel an emotion about it yeah. and and what happens is people act on the emotions without thinking mm. right so i don't know that's what happened here i think you actually did offend some people legitimately right just to be clear but yeah, yeah i mean certainly there are probably some other people that maybe didn't like what you said about them but they didn't come forward when your channel yeah, was smaller definitely possible definitely right? and then you yeah. got bigger and then it, it bec became more of a problem yeah, yeah. So the last question I want to ask you, this is something we touched on in our call, but I just wanted to talk about it here, is I won't name names, but there actually, here's, here's one like, uh, that we could probably discuss without getting in trouble. Logan Paul, right? Logan Paul, when he went on his trip to Japan and everything like that, there are clearly things in the YouTube community, like Logan Paul filming that body in Japan, that was bad. That was bad. His, he has... 18 million, 20 million subscribers, most of them being adolescents. That is bad behavior, which is possibly influencing. Like, when I see that, and I'm a father too, I'm like, okay, this this man is basically showing a younger generation that this behavior is okay because you're getting views, you're getting money, you're getting this, right? And something I've done on my channel is called out behaviors, not to the extreme of Logan Paul, but behaviors that could potentially be a bad influence, like... You know, I've worked with clients where, you know, especially in the drug and alcohol addiction treatment uh, field, like they've been influenced, like maybe their their substance use started by bad influence, whether it was their parents, whether it was their friends or whatever. So like, what, what are your thoughts on that? When a YouTuber is potentially being a bad influence, like are... Like, is there a right to call them out on that? Like, that's that's where I'm struggling here. Like, I'm not the YouTube police, but I think it's it's important to have some kind of voice of reason saying, this is not healthy behavior. Please do not emulate this. Right, well, and also it's just, it's criticism, right? We're allowed to be critical. Actually, we would be uh, kind of mandated to be critical in a sense if we're, if we're if our channels are about mental health and, and science and, and reason. So the important part is not extending beyond what the evidence supports, right? So I think Logan Paul there is a great example, right? What he did was appalling, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know why he did it, okay? okay? Was it impulsivity? Was it lack of empathy? Did, did he just, you know, was it just all a blur and it's like you're an action hero mm -hmm. when you're that big and you don't think about things? I don't know. 
So I can't really say his frame of mind, but I could certainly say this behavior is totally unacceptable. I gotcha. And so the, the more you kind of chase down a particular line of thinking, and the further you get away from the evidence, that's when you start to get into the danger zone. You just, I just had the aha moment, Todd. Okay, so that that might be where I cross that line, right? Where I, I in certain videos, I, I steered away from the evidence, because I use, I, I pride myself in using clips, and let me know your thoughts on this. I pride myself in using clips, but at some points, maybe I was trying to discuss the thought process behind the actions rather than the physical evidence of the actions. Do you think that might be part of where I cross that blurry thin line? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like whenever, whenever you move past the evidence and you start saying, well, I think I understand their motives, it's very hard to understand somebody's motive. And that's another problem with a public figure, right? Like you look at me and you might think this is how I really am in real life, right? Mm -hmm. The way I'm talking to you now, which it is, but you don't know that. Right? Yeah, because you haven't seen me in person teaching a class or, or running a group or whatever. So there's a public persona that we all have, mm. right? For example, you know, I'm fairly careful with my word selection, right? If I'm talking to somebody informally, I might not be right? yeah. because I know it's on YouTube and, you know, I know that it, it influences people and I don't want to do anything to create more stigma and I want to be helpful. So, yeah, I think um, when you look at that persona, there's a point we have to say, okay, this is what I see in the persona, but the person might be different, mm -hmm. right? Just like I think, you know, your persona on YouTube, right? People have gone beyond that and attacked you personally, right? You mentioned mm -hmm. that before. I think in that famous deleted video, right? You mentioned the, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no way to make a vein, no way to make a video more famous than delete it, right? So, <laughs> um, but either way, you know, that was, I think, uncalled for you, I think, had earned some criticism, to be sure, but mm -hmm. personal attacks, uh, the, they don't know what your frame of mind is, right? I don't know what your frame of mind is. I can make some assumptions. I have some work in my head, but I wouldn't say them. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we all form opinions. We have to be careful when expressing them. So do you think it's completely... Or, or like, so do you think it's completely off limits to assume somebody's thought process or do you have a suggestion for me, you know, just for example, um, Tana Mojo with TanaCon, based on the evidence, I don't know how much you knew about that, but VidCon, VidCon, the biggest YouTube convention, kind of screwed Tana over. She made a very spiteful video, right, saying F VidCon, F VidCon, F VidCon. Then, you know, there was a, 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 a trail of her saying, you know what, I'm going to create TanaCon out of spite, right? So she, she, made it, she made her convention on the same day as VidCon to try to pull in their audience. It, it appeared to be very, a very spiteful action, right? And then it crumbled, people got hurt, people went to the hospital. So I made some videos about that because I have personal experience where my emotions made me vindictive, which then backfired in my face and made me look worse. Like, do you think, like, like is there a way to explain the potential thought process without saying like this is for sure what they're thinking like or is that just something you think is a complete like red zone do not talk about that because it is a learning experience i think yeah i think you have to be again so that's drifting a little bit further away from the evidence you just have to be careful like you could say look i don't know what the frame of mind was but here here's you know a possibility or here's a few possibilities but i would really emphasize the disclaimer because you're really using it as a teachable moment, but it might mm -hmm. not have been a good case to select because you don't know what their motive really was. But if we, you know, if we stop too short, right, like we have to be allowed to speculate a little, right, and, and say, well, you know, if somebody did some certain action, like they committed a homicide, it's reasonable to think that they might have been angry, although some people aren't angry when they do that, right? But yeah. it's reasonable to think there's rage involved, right? Uh, if somebody's premeditated, it's reasonable to say that they were calculating, Right. But you don't know for sure. They could also have been on, on drugs. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that could be happening. So as long as you disclaim it, I think, in in a fairly kind of frequent and routine way and mm -hmm. don't extend it too far. I think that could stay in bounds. But you know, it's one of those things where one time you do it, it might be in bounds, and the next time it might be right on the line. Yeah. Right. So 
Yeah, I, I definitely think I've got, you know, especially with like some rules that you laid out after thinking about this and I have more conversations I'm going to be having. I think I think I got like I'm going to I'm going to be doing a lot of movies and TV shows and music. I think that'll help uh, <laughs> help things calm down a little bit. And I'm going to take my time before jumping back into the YouTube sphere. But I'm going to continue having conversations with you and other professionals and kind of see how we can do this, because, yes, millions of people are being influenced and how do we turn those into teachable moments without crossing boundaries with the creators you know but at the end of the day myself you a bunch of other mental health creators at the end of the day we're just trying to help people right yeah that's, that's the purpose of it and i think that's what to keep in mind i think that's what really went wrong before where people kind of again they saw that potential schadenfreude right they saw that maybe you were enjoying the the triggering aspect Whereas mm -hmm. if you know, you approached it differently and didn't do that and said, "Look, uh, you know, maybe I speculated too far here," and and were proactive, yeah. it would have made a difference. So, yeah, that's the other thing too. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. We have to always be kind of checking and and checking with the uh, the audience and making sure that what we're saying is resonating and that we're not going too far. And and probably that's probably my caution to you, right? And my caution to myself would be sometimes I have to go a little further because I'm so far away from the boundary. Right. Yeah. Uh, subscribers ask me oftentimes for like more personal details and a little bit more speculation. And you're kind of on the other side, pulling the other way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, hopefully we, we have a follow up at some point. To maybe uh, uh, in 90 days, we'll do a, an evaluation to see where I'm at. See, <laughs> <laughs> see how close I've come to that line. But anyways, thank you, Dr. Todd Grande and anybody watching all of Todd's uh, links and social media stuff will be down in the description below, and we are also recording a video over for his channel. Is there anything else going on in your world that you would like the Rewired Soul audience to know about before we go? You know, uh, I would just kind of um, make like one last kind of uh, statement around the value of flexible thinking. Right? It's a, a thing I always push, and I think it's a I think it's something that applies to you, but it really applies to everybody. We talked about it when I was talking about Jordan Peterson before. Mm -hmm. And how one of the things I like about Jordan is he he has opinions, but you get the sense that if you had evidence to the contrary, he would say, you know, let me rethink it. Mm -hmm. Right. So just one last note that flexible thinking is our friend. Yes. And there you go. I one thousand percent agree. We'll end on that note. So thanks again for being on my channel and we'll see all of you next time.